Welcome back to the Muzzle Blast Podcast, the official podcast of the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association. This week, we're taking a step back in time. I'm surrounded by piles and piles of old muzzle blasts. I've been going through each one of them one by one and finding some of the neater articles from past muzzle blasts. We've been publishing this for about 80 years now, and there's a ton of information in here that is stuck in all of these pages. Normally, we're just republishing these through the website, but um, like what we're sharing with you today is an article that works really well. It's got some history with it, and it's also got a little bit of how-to. So this week for the podcast, we're going through the Liberty Cap article from Muzzle Blast 1976 by Flintlock Larrabee. When you're done listening to the podcast today, be sure to check out the NMLRA YouTube channel and follow along with the video tutorial on how to make your own Liberty Cap. Of all of the interesting headgear associated with the American Revolution, one of the simplest forms was the Liberty Cap. The Liberty Cap was so simple, in fact, that no regular Continental units ever adopted it as an official hat. During the Revolution, this was generally a wool or cotton cap with the words Liberty or Liberty or Death embroidered across the front in an imposing color. A few battalion infantry and numerous light infantry units wore miters with this legend emblazoned across their fronts. Light infantry miters were sometimes embroidered with Liberty and a skull and crossbones, replacing the word death in liberty or death. The skulls required less room than the words death, and um, it was more easily affordable for these light infantry. The cloth liberty cap has a longer and more honorable history than the continental miters, a history beginning some 3,000 years ago as a symbol of freedom from slavery. It is not coincidence that the red stocking caps were fashioned among the yeomen during the 18th century, with Sam Adams, the historical-minded patriot leader, reviving the knowledge of the ancient red felt freeman's cap to popularize the liberty cap as a symbol of resistance to tyranny. In what is now Turkey, there once existed an ancient nation of Phrygia. Around 800 BC, Phrygia was conquered by Lydia, a country allied to the Greek cities that then dotted across Asia Minor. Conquered Phrygia then became the chief source of slaves for the city-states of Greece. Apparently a Phrygian slave normally went bareheaded, but when he in some way won his freedom, he would proudly don the red felt cap of his homeland to signify that he was now free an independent Phrygian once more. When the Greeks were in turn conquered by the Romans, the Romans, being admirers of Greek culture, adopted numerous Greek customs and laws. Among these was the tradition of the Phrygian cap, which had spread beyond the Phrygians to become a badge of liberty for freed men of any nationality. The conical hat passed into Roman law, being made part of a ceremony whereby a slave was granted his freedom called the act of manumission from the Latin manus, hand, and mitre, to let go. The slave knelt at the magistrate's feet. The cap on his head was tapped with a rod, and he declared a free man. The story of the ancient Phygrian cap does not end there, but in fact later became an emblem of revolt, with the slaves claiming their own freedom at no one's behest. Called a Pileus by the Romans, the cap became a symbol that was used against the Roman Empire. During times of unrest and upheaval, armies marching on Rome would put the Pileus on the points of their spears to signify to the slaves that freedom was theirs if they would abandon their masters and join the ranks of the insurgents. From the spear-supported Pileus came the idea of the Liberty Pole. Preceding the Liberty Pole was the Liberty Tree, the first one being an elm planted by the Puritans of Boston in 1646. The fiery Sam Adams designated it as a Liberty Tree after it had been used on the 14th of August, 1765 by the Sons of Liberty to hang an effigy of Lord Brute, author of the Stamp Act, and Andrew Oliver, the royal government's Boston distributor of the hated stamps. The tree thereafter became a rallying point of the Sons of Liberty until the Patriots of Boston were expelled or cowed by the Redcoat Garrison after Lexington and Concord. Evacuating Boston under the threat of guns placed on Dorchester Heights, where General Howe was loath to risk another Bunker Hill, the British spitefully cut down the Liberty Elm as they left. In other towns throughout the 13 colonies, community leaders would fly a flag, often emblazoned with the words Liberty or Union, from the highest tree near the village green. When the Boston Port Bill was passed, whereby George III sought to force the Bostonians to recompense the East India Company for the tea dumped into the harbor during the famous Boston Tea Party, Whig communities throughout the land sprang into aid of the blockaded Boston. The people of Farmington, Connecticut, sent 400 bushels of rye and Indian corn. 
When the news of the port bill reached Farmington, a handbill was circulated which read, To pass through the fire at six o'clock this evening, in honor of the immortal goddess of liberty, the late infamous act of the British Parliament for further distressing the American colonies, the place of execution will be the public parade where all sons of liberty are desired to attend. A thousand patriots crowded around the village green and cheered lustily as a copy of the Boston Port Bill was burned. They cheered again as a 45-foot-tall liberty pole was erected into the evening sky, a bright red pileus at its top, the liberty cap. The Farmington Pole may have had a liberty flag attached to it as well, and by 1776 such flags were being carried into battle. This flag was now known as the Continental Flag, since it came from not one state, but several. Liberty trees and the Phrygian caps quickly became devices used on new-made battle flags as evidence of the so-called White Plains Flag, which Hessian troops claimed they captured from the Americans on August 27, 1776, during the Battle of Long Island. It is called the White Plains flag because there is some dispute as to whether the Patriots actually lost it, another view being that it was taken during the Battle of White Plains on October 28th, another United States defeat in the Battle of New York. The White Plains flag is emblazoned with the words liberty or death over a cross, sword, and staff. The staff or spear is supporting a light blue pileus, blue because the field is red. The Germans who captured it themselves not long after came to grief, being taken prisoner during the Battle of Trenton on December 26, their commander, Colonel Rawl, being mortally wounded. Following the American Revolution, the famous pamphleter Thomas Paine traveled to France. A tireless revolutionary and himself English-born, he also slipped into England and tried to stir rebellion there, but he was forced to flee, escaping to France one step ahead of the police. In France, Paine was warmly welcomed, the monarchy having been overthrown there, and he was made a member of the French Assembly. Alas, his welcome was not to last, and he was jailed during the terror, narrowly avoiding the guillotine. Paine found that Adam's revival of the Pileus had preceded him, being adopted first by the Republican French as the Bonnet Rouge. The unstable French Republic was followed by the empire of Napoleon Bonaparte, who, combining the ideals and symbols of the revolution with his own tutorial authority, fashioned the French army into a conquering power. Thus, he was able to overthrow various ancient thrones in Europe, disposing among them the Spanish king. In this manner, the Phrygian cap returned as a symbol of liberty to the Western Hemisphere, for the nationalists of Latin America seized the opportunity granted by Spain's prostration to declare independence of their own countries. Today we find the Phrygian cap used as devices on various South and Central American national flags, which are also usually tricolors inspired by the tricolor of revolutionary France. Both the Liberty Cap and the Liberty Pole are featured on these Latin America banners, though the pole probably represents the cap-hung spear of Roman times. The national signs of Colombia, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Paraguay, and Argentina's presidential standard all feature Liberty Caps and Liberty Pole. It is a sad irony that some of these countries are today dictatorships from which liberty hath flown, strong gun control laws being central features of the tyrannic structures of these dictatorships. In the meanwhile, back at the ranch, so to speak, in the United States, today the Liberty Cap is not forgotten. In the old Bay State, Massachusetts, where it all began, by the rude bridge that arched the flood, the very cradle of the American Revolution, the Liberty Cap is enjoying an ardent revival. Spreading throughout New England, this is due for the most part of one man, Leslie Herbert of Weymouth, Massachusetts, a lifelong arborist. Mr. Herbert served as Weymouth's tree warden until his retirement in 1967, upon which he began his career as New England's only professional liberty pole raiser. Conducting a campaign to interest the public in liberty trees, and Boston's liberty tree in particular, Mr. Herbert in 1964 succeeded in inducing Governor Endicott Peabody to sign a proclamation making August 14th the Commonwealth's Liberty Tree Day. With the arrival of the Bicentennial, an increasing number of towns are organizing annual Liberty Pole Days, complete with ceremony and celebration. When he participates in these ceremonies, Mr. Herbert, attired in 18th century regalia, is the Grand Marshal of the event, leading a procession of costumed Liberty Boys and patriotic ladies to the town common. Following the Grand Marshal is a lady carrying a small black coffin labeled Liberty, follow in turn by men trundling the Liberty Pole, its butt end laid in a special two-wheeled cart. When the Liberty Pole arrives at the green, fifers and drummers are playing a Liberty tune, and the music stops when the ceremony begins. 
The coffin is placed on the grass, and a handful of dirt is thrown onto it symbolically, burying it. Liberty is dead, liberty is dead, goes up in the cry. Then, in defiance of tyranny, staunch Minutemen raise the liberty pole and fix it in place. A dollar has been fixed to the top of the pole, and this will be the reward for any robust youth who can shinny up to the top and place the liberty cap there. However, before this can be done, a detachment of redcoats appear. They advance on the rebellious pole with the intent of cutting it down. Violence, quotes there, breaks out as the Liberty Boys defend the pole, bayonets and musket butts being pitted against wooden clubs, but the Patriots prove too numerous for the lobster backs, and they withdraw to the cheers and catcalling of the crowd. The ceremony resumes, with numerous boys trying and failing to shinny up the pole, until one finally succeeds amid the applause and huzzahing of the throng. Mr. Herbert makes a short oration, a Minuteman detachment fires a musket volley, and the band strikes up. The ceremony is over. Quoted in Yankee Magazine, October 1975, Mr. Herbert says, The Liberty Cap is a tradition almost 3,000 years old, and the Liberty Pole is a way of displaying that symbol of free men. It is important that somebody remembers. Personally, before I began diving into these old muzzle blasts and the bicentennial era, especially with the 250th anniversary coming up, I hadn't really heard much about the Liberty Cap. I feel like I've heard of the Sons of Liberty and the Liberty Tree, but the Liberty Pole and the Liberty Cap kind of escaped my memory. Um, ironically, during this, the research for this episode, uh, my father was actually building a flintlock pistol. And we were going through books on early flintlocks in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and even down into Kentucky. And we, keep, we kept finding this symbol of a, of a lady with this kind of pointed and arched cap that we didn't, it was, it was an odd face. And to be honest, at the beginning, we didn't know that it was a lady. And we, we kept researching, trying to figure out what this person was and, and why it kept appearing on rifles, especially of the revolutionary times. And the more research we did, we discovered that that was an early symbol for Lady Liberty. And she's wearing one of these Liberty caps. It's this, you know, it kind of looks like a sock on her head, but it's, it's, just a simple cap that is kind of arced and turned. And looking for more information on this, you can actually go to the Architect of the Capitol, which is a, a U.S. government site that focuses solely on the architecture and the art available in Washington, D.C. And there's some more information here. I'll have a link in the show notes. But they go through and explain some of the history that we talked about from this article, but they also reference its significance in architecture and even coins of the 18th and 19th century. And this is something I had, I had no idea about, which is, I feel like I'm, <laughs> I really enjoy a lot of this. And, um, but I'm constantly reminded as a young person, especially that there's always more research to be done and always more for me to go and, and find out. If you're interested in this, I encourage you to look up aoc.gov and it's going to have some information in here. It actually has some of the early designs for the Statue of Liberty, where Lady Liberty is wearing a Liberty cap instead of the crown that we know her to be wearing today. As I read the last section and the quote from Mr. Herbert, it's important that somebody remembers. And I'm, I kind of get chills because I, I had no idea this existed. And, and now I do. And it's, it's super fascinating that we know that the founding fathers were looking back to Greece and to Rome on how to structure this country. But even down to the symbolism that was used during, you know, before Christ, 800 BC, they're talking about. I mean, that's a, it's super neat that, that that cohesiveness of this cap came through and then spread around the world. I just think that's fascinating. Um, this is a little bit of a different episode for us here at Muzzle Blast. We really appreciate you guys listening. COVID-19 is still kind of wreaking havoc on us. Um, you can always check out nmlra.org slash COVID-19 for up-to-date information. As of recording, the large piece of information is that the NMLRA June national shoot has been canceled. And that's by guidelines from the Indiana State Department of Health. By the time that the June shoot would normally roll around, we're limited here in Indiana to a gathering of 100 people. And um, we 
normally, you know, attract 10,000 or more. So the, um, the 100 person limit, just, it's not going to be feasible for us to have this event. Um, so if you're listening to this down the road, you know, that information isn't, it's not relevant, but, um, if you're listening in 2020, you know, we appreciate your patience with us during this. The board is working constantly on how to, how to get through this and what we need to do to change things up. Right now, I know it's a, a bummer that the June Nationals are canceled, but we're working on planning a series of smaller weekend shoots that fit within the um, the attendee limit through the month of July and August and in, in build up to our September National Championships. If you enjoy the show, we please ask that you rate us on iTunes. That helps us get seen and get recommended to more people. If you have a friend or know of somebody who might be interested in what we're covering in the podcast, please send them a link. Um, we'd really appreciate that. We can share this as much as we can on social media and things, but um, we really depend on you sharing it with your friends and loved ones that might be interested to get the word out and, uh, and help us keep this going. If you're interested in supporting the show, you can use the code PODCAST10 at the NMLRA.org store. This will get you 10% off of just about any order there in the store, and it just lets us know that you came from the podcast and gives you a little thank you for listening.